Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good evening or maybe even good morning, uh, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, today is the third and final installment in the three-part symposium that we have done on um, A.D. Gordon in his time and ours, our collective effort to uh, bring into the conversation, especially in the English-speaking world, uh, this remarkable um, thinker and historical figure who's been undergoing a bit of renaissance in, in Israel uh, that we've heard about and we'll be hearing about more, and who has much to say to both to enrich our historical understanding as well as illuminate present-day concerns. Um, and a collective effort this has been. So before we start this final meeting, I just very much want to thank um, our, our partners in the uh, Tauber Center for Jewish Studies at Brandeis University, Sylvia Fuchs-Fried and, and David Brion. Um, by the way, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Yehuda Mirsky. I'm um, on the faculty of the Department of Near Eastern and Judaic Studies and on the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies um, at Brandeis. And I, it's always a pleasure to thank uh, my colleagues. Um, so you'll be hearing shortly from my colleague, Alex Kay, who's the Stoll Family Chair of Israel Studies. He will be managing our uh, question, the question portion of our meeting. Um, none of these would have happened without our director, uh, Professor Jonathan Sarna, our associate directors, um, Dr. Shana Weiss and Risa Singer, um, uh, Karen Goodblatt and Wendy Schwartz, and are the remarkable Anna Simpson who put this all together for us in uh, so many ways. Now, I would like to introduce our uh, speakers. Uh, we have a um, marvelous uh, panel here. Uh, and today, um, as we round this out, we'll be talking about Gordon and Jewish nationalism and environmentalism and Jewish culture. And we really can't have, couldn't have asked for, for a better um, group of folks. Um, so uh, working in, so to speak, reverse English alphabetical order, I'll first introduce uh, Shay Rabinow. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Shay Rabinow, um, not least because he indeed is a graduate of um, Brandeis and did his PhD uh, in the Department of Near Eastern Judaic Studies and was a fellow at the Schusterman Center. And he's now assistant professor of Israel Studies and Associate Director of the Center for Israel Studies at the State University of New York in Binghamton. Um, his book manuscript, Walking the Land, A History of Israeli Hiking Trails, is under review uh, for um, academic publication. Uh, his research interests are Israel-Palestine, Middle East walking and pilgrimage routes, Israeli environmental history, and the historical geography of the Middle East. He teaches courses in modern Israel, culture, society in Israel, in Israeli environmental history. So Shay, uh, welcome back um, to virtual wall fan. Thank you. Um, and we'll be hearing from Ron Margolin. Ron Margolin is professor of modern Jewish thought in the Department of Jewish Philosophy and Comparative Religion in Tel Aviv University. He's also a research fellow at the Shalom, Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem at its Kogod's Research Center. Um, Ron is a remarkably accomplished scholar of great catholicity um, in his interests, both in, uh, he studies uh, modern Jewish thought, he studies religious myth and existential thought, um, he studies contemporary Jewish thought, and also is uh, one of the rare scholars who beautifully, to my view, uh, synthesizes rich textual Jewish scholarship and philosophical analysis and deep study of comparative religion. Um, and he is the author of two books, um, Hebrew, uh, one, Mikdash Adam, Hafnama Datit, Bitsu Chaya Darat Nimim, Rashiya Chasidut, a study of the internalization of religious life in early Hasidism. And um, in the second volume, a phenomenological study of the internalization of religious life and the states of mind and experience in general. Experience, there's that word in work. Um, and last, but by no means least, um, Ruth, Dr. Ruth Calderon. Uh, Ruth Calderon, the scholar, teacher, public intellectual, former member of Knesset, um, graduate of Oranin College, Haifa University, and did her MA and PhD in Talmud from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, and in 1989, uh, she, speaking of pioneers, she established um, the first Israeli secular 
pluralist egalitarian Beit Midrash for women and men, um, Alma in so in which eventually became Alma in uh, Tel Aviv. Um, sort of both done scholarly work, especially in Talmudic narratives, and lots of work in public intellectual and print and on television. Um, and some of you may be familiar with her political career when she was a member of Knesset for the Eshatid party. Um, her initial in the uh, 2013 elections, uh, some of you may be familiar with her uh, opening speech in the Knesset, which became a YouTube sensation. And I can tell you, I have taught it um, any number of times. It's a remarkable gig text um, in its own. And um, in November, she was nominated to become the president of the World Zionist Organization, which is also yet um, another first. And in addition to her many other awards, one can't help note her honorary degree for her brain. Anyway, so thank you all very, very much. I'm really delighted that you're here. And so, Ruth Calderon, I'd like to start with you. Um, as we move towards the close of this series. Yehuda, I need you to come closer to the microphone because I don't hear. We'll do. Okay, we'll do. We'll do. Please. So as we as we start moving towards the close of this series, and but before we start getting into some of the questions of environmentalism, nationalism, et cetera, we're going to talk today, could you talk a little bit about your sense of Gordon's place in contemporary Israeli culture, Jewish culture in the past and, and present? And his and and his effects, um, such as they've been on Israeli secular Jewish identity, bearing in mind that we spent a whole session last time talking about how Gordon wonderfully dissolves the distinctions between religions. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Yuda, and it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. And in this Zoom time, the, the fact that the wall fell and we're all in a click of a, a computer and get together across uh, nations, not just nations, the ocean. Um, I'm happy to be here. And I'm grateful for the, the subject because I, I, Gordon, Aleph Dalit Gordon, Avram David Gordon is very dear to me and always have been. And if I'm trying to think what is his special voice or tone between Bialik and uh, Brenner and, Go and, and the others that we were educated on. Um, he was the spiritual one. And maybe because he was a little older than the other pioneers. And maybe because he was a traditional, his secularity um, had a very strong religiosity that when I was educated in Oranim and we read a lot of uh, Yosef Chaim Brenner, who stood for the hard truth and, and hard, uh, bare secularism, and Bialik that is talking about uh, the new Hebrew culture and the knowledge, Gordon was a voice of saving the need for relig religiosity that I felt as a child and as a person growing up and in the secular Israel that I was growing up in, in the 60s and 70s, there was no, there was no uh, language to talk about the holy, to talk about feeling, being grateful, feeling awe in front of nature, in front of human beings. This was for me, Adam Ve'ateva, that Ron Margolin I, uh, has uh, edited now. Yes, I'll be, I'll be getting to that. I was about, just about to put in the chat. I'll be getting to that. For me, the uh, man in nature was the text of, of giving me permission or giving us permission to come above the very concrete hard truth of the everyday life that secularism tried to educate itself to be. People that saw themselves as Luftmensches, uh, Men, Jewish uh, men flying in the air, like in a Chagall picture, and they wanted to become the new Jew, to be fierce, to be down to earth, to be practical, to work in a field. And Gordon allowed us to still bring back the, the feeling of, of God inside uh, the world and in our world, although we are considered at that time secular Jews, and that was very important to me and for me. 
The other thing, just for an opening, and I'm sure Shai is going to go deeper into that, our education in school and in the scouts, in the youth movement, was education through the legs. And we had to walk the land and know every detail of name of a bird or a bee, or in my case, uh, uh, insects too, because my father was an uh, entomologist. And through knowing the private name of the different, uh, you know, chokhiyot, drorim, or bulbul, or duchifat, we, we try to make believe that we are natives in this country, that we are here for generations, but, but we were not. And everybody had parents speaking in two different uh, accents that are not Hebrew Israeli, but, but the birds and the, and the landscape, and it's called doing uh, doing uh, valley, uh, streams, streams. It was, uh, according to your age, you had to walk and jump and, and climb more and more difficult hikes because you learned to love your country through your legs. And it did educate, and of course it's German romanticism and it wasn't made here, but for us, it did um, enable us to be in the field to be, I remember myself walking by myself. That was a very big deal to walk alone, to, to be, you know, to sleep outside. I hope my children don't uh, even hear this. And I remember a day when I saw a herd of uh, does, a lot, jumping in, in uh, Nachal El Al, in the Golan. And I stood there and I felt that I see God. And that was something that was not allowed, it was not polite to talk like that in school, in the scouts. We were very, very hard seculars, but Gordon and his uh, urge to, to be who you are when you're connected to nature, to work as a process of, of as a work of art, I would say, to, as he would say, to play the violin, to play the, um, uh, the or the, 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 right, the harrow. And although I, I'm a city girl and I was brought up in the, in the city and we, we never worked in agriculture, I somehow I swallowed this uh, image of, of being one with the place and giving my hard work to it and through that doing my religious work. We were very mixed up. We did not have uh, official religious education. And so the vocabulary that he used was for me very necessary for the people who did need or want to have spirituality in secular Jewish Israeli life. And I wanna say that secular Jewish Israeli life is full of spirituality and full of culture. I see Tel Aviv as a, one of the major successes of Jewish of uh, Zionism in the fact that there is a total uh, urban secular Jewish environment where everything is Jewish. There's a Jewish buzz to it, although you don't have to necessarily walk into a synagogue or uh, be connected to a certain community. So, Gordon, as a start, I would want to say. I'm so grateful to him and love him for the stories about how he danced in a trance and how he made uh, Shabbat, Shabbat uh, dinners and, and dancing and singing in a way that was breaking the code of we are very down to earth secular people that Israel started with. And I think today there's a great effect both in the traveling that that's like that's what you do when you grow up here, especially the holiday that's coming now in Pesach. Everyone will be in all the valleys and hiking. And that becomes what part of Israeli education. And also in the way that he enables us, because he was a religious person, free of any religious institution in religious politics. He was just him and a kind of a father, although I'm older than him now, which is shocking. Uh, but when he was 40, he was considered old. 
know what happens. And he has a relationship with uh, Rachel, the poet. I'll, I'll be happy to share a poem later on that for me is the picture of, of, be, of doing Gordon uh, in Israel. So that is my... Thank you. This, this, this is just wonderful. I have just one quick follow-up question. When you were first taught, when you were taught Gordon, I'd say, or Anin, yeah. was he taught as a quote-unquote secular figure or in that context, or that there was this sense that this, that he's not exactly, he's, he's nobody's conventional idea of a religious figure, but he's not a conventional idea of a secular thinker either. How was he presented then? Yes, in Oranim, we read Adam Vateva, the man in nature, like yes. a prayer book, and he was framed as the opposite of Brenner, of Yosef Chaim Brenner. He right. was the, the one with the religiosity and Brenner was the one saying there's no God and don't even think about it. So the spiritual guys, people, me, uh, kind of were more Gordonian, more mm -hmm. uh, with the lights and the, yeah. the hardcore seculars were, and in Israel Brenner was very much the thing to be, like a bit depressed and, and you know, uh, yeah, so it's there still there still are two uh, kind of houses of thought, and I was drawn to the golden one. Well, knows maybe we'll do a follow up on Brenner because Brenner, as you know, has been getting. Ah, uh, Brenner is a hero. Uh, all sorts yeah. of ways, and uh, indeed, our doctoral student Yarbar Tsuri was with us last week. One third of his dissertation was Gordon, another third is, is Brenner. So thank you so much. And now, run. Yeah. Um, I very much would like to talk about, indeed, this new volume that you co-edited with Yuval Jubani, this new edition of Gordon's monumental essay, Ha'adam Vehateva. Um, and I am going to also now put out in the chat um, the website of uh, the Magnus Press. And as you know, like Gordon, as you, as you mentioned to me, Gordon's book here is published philosophy series, not sort of plain old Jewish studies. So Ron, I'd be delighted if you please could um, tell us about the work that you and Yuval have done on this new edition of Gordon's, perhaps his, his central work, thinking about it, and what he found. Take it from there, please. Um, yes, I can, uh, I can speak about uh, this book and the reason that we decided to to prepare a new edition of uh, this uh, uh, essay, big essay, because um, many of Gordon's writings were essay essays concerning practical issues that were discussed among his friends, economical discussions concerning the meaning of socialism, military defense, etc. But uh, the man and nature is beyond these daily discussions of his time. It is a philosophical essay. His will was that his readers will read in his writings only in case that they will find something which can revive them and will contribute to the renewal of their life. And this text is beyond temporary issues. Um, Gordon published in his life only the first pages uh, in the paper of the young worker, Poel Atzair. The full text was edited first time by his daughter and his friend Aronovich, and second time later, 30 years later, by one of his students, Shochat, and the important philosopher Hugo Bergman. Uh, we, Val Giovanni and, uh, and me, we decided uh, um, uh, uh, we decided to look for, for the original manuscript in order to search after the full text. We assumed that we shall find unknown paragraphs and especially we understood that because the text was edited, therefore we can try to improve it, for example, by some new changes in the order of ch chapters or by adding chapter that are integrative part of the essay and the previous editor decided to, om to omit. This is not a new book. You can find the same ideas or most of the ideas uh, by in the new edition, but I think that now we can see better his philosophical point of view. We went to Dganya and the manager of Gordon House, the later Malia Ilan gave us five envelopes with small and nice handwriting in, a, a hand, in, in Gordon's handwriting. 
we decided to photocopy all the pages and began our work. His editors omitted, we found that his editors omitted his most extreme criticism, for example, against the Jews of Europe, and we brought it back to the text. The what, were some, you were not just taking a second, what, what were some of those criticisms that the editors omitted? Oh, he spoke very extremely against the uh, economic life of the Jews in, in, in Europe. Uh, he wrote it in many places, but uh, in that paragraph that we decided to add because it was part of the text, it was not something, and they omitted it. Uh, he, he, he spoke about the not normal uh, economical life of, of the Jews in Europe, uh, the less of production, productivity and the need uh, to change the Jewish life. Uh, and uh, it was uh, very important in his, in his uh, vision, but, but I think that the editors didn't want that such an extreme paragraph will be part of such, uh, such a text. They tried to give it more, um, maybe to, to, be, uh, to, to diminish the prophecy, the, the uh, Gordon was his character in some of the paragraphs, especially in the end and the beginning, was the, his style was the style of prophet, and uh, they tried to make him to make him more more normal, more ordinary man. Uh, but we think that this was uh, important to to bring back uh, such par paragraphs. Uh, we 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 did more more things. This is uh, I, I tried to give some some examples, but uh, we changed the order of, of the, uh, the book. Uh, we put together all the, the sections or the paragraphs concerning religion because they didn't put it together. Uh, we found the original envelopes and we saw that uh, they changed the order. So we, we, had, we had the same permission to rebuild the order of the, these chapters. And now I think that after this change, we can see that Gordon was a philosopher of religion, religiosity, and secularism. He had a, 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 a full, full thought concerning these issues. And uh, the impression was that uh, because of the, 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 the previous uh, edition, that uh, he had only thoughts from time to time about these issues, but when we concentrate, it concerning the topic, and now it's a main topic in the book, uh, maybe false or, or, or something like this. Uh, uh, when we see, then we see that uh, the question of religion, the question of uh, the problem of fossilization of religion by orthodoxy uh, became, uh, were very, these issues were very important for, for, for Gordon. So, um, I think that um, there is no uh, there is no change. There is a big change. Uh, sometimes <laughs> when you edit things from the beginning, you can you can show things that before were in the margin and now they are in, in the center. And maybe this can support what Ruth talked about <laughs> the, uh, the religious aspect of of, uh, of Gordon among among the. Um, the uh, people of the Aliyah Shniyah, the second uh, big immigration to, the, to Palestine, the land of Israel. Uh, and and uh, this is maybe um, something that we can do only after 100 years, because before they were very close to, to, to the life, to the people. And uh, the mission of Gordon was to transfer main subjects of us and aspects of religion to the new generation and to the new situation. So he transferred uh, many, many topics and many uh, um, uh, uh, concepts uh, by speaking about Kabbalistic and Hasidic and, 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 and traditional uh, concepts in, 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 new, in new language. For example, uh, Gordon does not speak or didn't speak uh, about God. He spoke about the hidden intellect. He took it from some books, but uh, all the time he spoke about the hidden intellect. And uh, I can give more examples to, to show how he tried to, to translate, to, mm -hmm. to, to do the, the transition or the, 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 um, the, his ability to speak 
religiously or religion, uh, religion language in secular language, by secular or to secular people, something like this. And I and I I I, man, I wonder if you'd agree in saying or just that that when Gordon does this, it's not like he's trying to make the young people religious. In these no. Also, as as Ruth was saying, he uses these ideas, but he doesn't. Per, he, he, religious authority structures, both in practice as well as the authority structures that dictate how texts are supposed to be interpreted, he essentially does away with. So he's 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 both transferring, as you said these sort of theological ideas to the new generation, but he's also trying to rewrite or rethink from the ground these theological oh, ideas. He, he, chose, he chose to be part of the new generation of, the, uh, uh, of his time, and he understood their, uh, their situation, their rebellion uh, against uh, orthodoxy, and mm -hmm. he was part of this because he also, in his, in his uh, Shtetl uh, and among uh, the, the Hasidic family of his wife, for example, that he didn't uh, mm -hmm. couldn't live with them, uh, he, he, he felt uh, he had a long or uh, many, many uh, uh, problems with the fossilized, with the, with the, um, uh, I think that I can say that his main, main problem was the religion was more important than the religiosity, the, the uh, habits, the uh, tradition was more than God itself. For, for him, there are things that can't be, uh, that we must think again and from, from the beginning about them. Uh, and and uh, for the big, maybe the main example is his attitude toward, toward work and their idea of how to continue or how to transfer again, translate the big idea of Hasidism, of uh, um, uh, working in corporality, uh, to the new life of the pioneers. And he did it by the idea of work and agricultural work, and and uh, Ruth spoke about the image of, of Gordon. I think that in, in this point, uh, his influence was big. Uh, my grandfather was a farmer, and uh, from this point of view, he was like Gordon, and he was not socialist. He had a fa private farm, but when he worked in his farm, um, the picture that I can see was the same picture that we can see from the famous, uh, that famous picture about Gordon uh, in, 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 in the Ghana. I, I think that many, many of the, uh, the, the third immigrate, uh, immigrators uh, the, uh, the, who were students of Gordon and, or, or who were uh, uh, educated in Gordonia, one of the uh, important uh, youth movements, that uh, founded many kibbutzim, um, they were influenced by this understanding of working in, in nature as working of God. Uh, and the devotion uh, to the work was devotion, was a, religion, a kind of religious devotion. Mm -hmm. uh, right. It was not the religion of work. He didn't say this is not his invention. Right. You know, we, we talked about that, that he never, um, he never used use this term the religion of labor because work for him was creativity and and uh, 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 this this was the point so yes. uh, this is the reason why we think that his uh, writings are very important today even though we are there, don't we don't speak about agricultural uh, work as the mission of our generation because for him the point was not the agriculture as agriculture the point was thing was creativity and nature for him was the origin of creation, was the mm -hmm. origin of this right. process of creativity. Right. And, and, and this is the point that we can see ourselves or we yeah. can find interest in his writings mm -hmm. today, 100 years after uh, he, 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 de he died and, and, and uh, so many changes in the, in the world and in Israel, of course. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. But still speaking of nature, nature not just, of course, you're quite right that for Gordon and so many other thinkers, when they, you know, we use the word nature about trees and the birds and the fish, 
because they are truly what they are, right? I'm seeking sort of some sense of getting things to be truly what they are. But there is still greenery and flora and fauna. And Shay Ravenow, I'd like to turn to you. Um, so a lot of these ideas sound rather abstract. But from exchanges that you and I have had, um, I get the impression that your research has shown that Gordon's very abstract philosophical ideas actually had very concrete effects um, in all kinds of things in Israeli political geography and people's environmental thinking and educational practices. Please tell us more. I'd love to hear about it. Sure. Thanks. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, Ruth kind of prefaced a little bit about the things of the things that I would like to talk about, because she has these personal experiences that I never had the benefit of having as an American. Uh, but coming in and kind of researching this from the outside, you know, I've found Gordon a really remarkable figure and his effects have been enormous um, in terms of, you know, pra Zionist practices and the way Israeli education works and things like that. Some of the things that Ruth mentioned. Um, you know, in thinking about some of the comments that I wanted to share regarding my own work on hiking trails and Israel's environmental movement and how those kind of have worked together, um, you know, I, I've, I've been interested in how Gordon's thinking kind of helped create this dichotomy, well, kind of a, a relationship between people and nature as intertwined in a way that gives rise to this reciprocal dynamic, right? So I was mentioning to Yehuda earlier that um, this concept of hagshama, right, of, self, of kind of, of actualization um, is applied to both the people and the land. And I think this is pretty well known about Gordon, but the effects aren't always as well known. Uh, but the idea that uh, when people interact, when, when Jews interact with the Jewish homeland and they come in contact with the land of Israel in these kind of visceral and physical ways um, with the, the earth and the soil through the act of labor, Right, both the people and the land are supposed to be transformed. Uh, so the, the Jewish body becomes muscular and strong in this engagement with nature, this productive engagement. And then the land itself is transformed as well, right? Through development and buildings and roads and orchards, fields, right? It becomes fruitful in, in every way. And um, you know, I think the most succinct and concise formulation of this that we see in, in Zionist history and thought is you know, this pioneer lyric, right? Banu Arza Livnot Ulehi Banot Ba. Right? We came to the land to build it and to be built in it. And, um, you know, to, to build the land became uh, emphasized uh, even in Gordon's lifetime as the foundation of this really aggressive building ethos in Zionism to build, to build, to build, right? Throughout the British mandate period, uh, as it becomes more and more apparent that Jews and Arabs will be competing for control over the land building the land was, of course, an imperative. And I think uh, Gordon's thought, this idea of uh, actualizing the land and actualizing the Jewish body and Jewish identity uh, really worked well uh, toward the interests of the state to be. Um, so the, to me, I've, I've been interested in kind of how this leads to a paradox, though, right? Because um, if you spin this out to its end, this idea of building the land, of, of self-actualization through building the land kind of creates a situation in which the kibbutznik is um, coming into contact with undeveloped spaces, right? Pure nature, digging the plow into the soil for the first time. Once you do that, it can't be undone, right? The field exists, the settlement exists, the road exists, and you have to go outward in order to seek these prime experiences once again. If you keep doing that, you run out of space uh, for developing the land. And so the constructive ethos of Zionism can only go so far. And there has to be a point at which you have to slow it down and say, we need to be able to preserve nature in order for people to still have a meaningful relation, relationship with it. Um, and that's nature maybe with a, with a small n, as opposed to Gordon's more encompassing idea of nature. But I think this is the way people ended up framing it, right? Man and nature in terms of the developer and the developed. Um, and eventually that had to be reined in. And how, can you say a little bit more about that? That yeah. process, reining in people? Because we've talked about, right, you know, people went on draining the swamps, even when it turned out that draining the swamps was a terrible idea because draining swamps is what Zionists were supposed to do, right? <laughs> right. So how, you know, how sort of, how, how are those issues? And I guess, you know, do you wonder, does Gordon provide resources for environmental, for, you know, on the one hand, Gordon sort of stimulates or the idea of Gordon 
uh, the image of him, right, as we said earlier, he never actually said religion of labor sort of stimulates all this endless development, but there seems to be presumably there's resources in Gordon's thought for also saying, wait a second. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that you, if, I mean, if you look more closely, right, obviously he's not just about developing space and developing, I mean, this is kind of, the, these are like the prosaic dimensions of what people do with, with, uh, with Gordon's thought. And I think other Zionist thinkers come in and kind of build on that, right? I mean, um, it, we can look at, at Israeli literature as kind of a, a, a direction in which this moves. Um, uh, the, the famous poem about developing the country, right, is Natana Alterman's Song of the Homeland, 1935, Shira Moledet very famous poem that Alterman writes and he's kind of like this poet laureate type of figure. I mean, uh, reflects uh, the way a lot of people look at the land. And um, just, to, I mean, to read an excerpt for those who are not so familiar, all right? He says, I mean, you know, you get this imagery of the land and, and the beauty of the land. On the mountains, the sun already blazes. In the valley, the dew still shines. We love you, homeland, with joy, with song, and with toil. From the slopes of Lebanon to the Dead Sea, we shall crisscross you with plows. We shall yet cultivate and build you. We shall yet beautify you, right? There's this anthropomorphization of the land as being beautified through all this development. We will dress you in a gown of concrete and cement and lay for you a carpet of gardens, right? Um, and it keeps going, right? The desert wilderness, we will cross the swamps, we will drain. And uh, <laughs> right, this resonates with a lot of people. And, uh, and, and, you know, this ethos prevails into the early years of Israeli independence. And uh, I think the big tragedy, uh, the best known tragedy that happens in those early years is the draining of the Hula swamps in the northern part of the country in the 1950s. And um, that was really, uh, you know, it was, it was the thing, it's what Zionists did. It was taken for granted at the time as something you do to the land to make it fruitful uh, as part of that constructive ethos. But there was really, by that time, there was, no, it was, it was almost a symbolic thing to do. There was no real benefit, not much real benefit to it in comparison to the ecological cost. And at the time, only a few people really rose up to protest against it and it failed, right? The, the swamps were drained today. If you go up to Kiryat Shmona, you see a lot of farmland up there where there had once been swamps and lakes and a home for migratory birds and so on. But out of the ashes of kind of that disaster rose the Hebra Le Teva, right? The Society for Protection of Nature in, in Israel. And uh, this is where the other side, I think of Gordon's uh, thought that hadn't been spun out quite so much came to the fore. Uh, the veneration of unspoiled nature. I mean, uh, when we go back to, I'm, I don't know, I've just been flipping through, right, looking at some of Gordon's letters uh, in which he'll sit on top of a mountain and describe to his readers the land he's seeing, right? And to me, this it's kind of an archetype of what you see on these Yediata Aretz oriented hikes uh, that you may go on today in Israel, where a nature guide is saying, like Ruth was saying, here are the names of these plants and insects. And, 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 and Gordon wasn't the first to do that, but he is, he's, he's modeling that for successive generations of Israelis in his, in his writings. Um, so it's the people who were influenced by Gordon to go and hike, to go and explore the youth movements, eventually the Palmach, who end up rising up and saying, look, it's not just about building. It's also about venerating nature. Um, and, and I have to say also, speaking about that and the Palmach, in um, Ron, in Ron Margolin and Yuval Jubani's new edition of Hadam Teva, in the preface, right, they bring this remarkable little factoid that the fact that in Israel, you tend not to see commercial billboards on intercity highways is thanks to Samach Yizhar, Yizhar Smolensky, right, and when he was member of Knesset, Right, Ron, if, if I remember correctly, he, he introduced legislation saying you can't have billboards on these intercity highways. And he said, because I am one of the last disciples of Gordon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Gordon, it's interesting. Gordon yeah. wrote this, Gordon wrote also in the, in the nature about this phenomena in Europe. And when, when he came back to Europe before his death, and he wrote after that that uh, this impression that we say he saw all the uh, advertisements, uh, information in the in in the roads between the cities, uh, and uh, he 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 spoke against it. And uh, some of his heart took this idea, his idea to 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 legislate the, the, this decision uh, in the after reading the, after reading this in Gordon my book. I mean, I have to say, I was talking, a panelist from our first session, Ari Ackerman, 
he and I were talking a little while ago about how Eliezer Shvai, right, sort of the great interpreter of Gordon and Israeli intellectual life, I agree, um, had that book about a decade ago called Gordonian Essays, Masot Gordonio, which was this sort of like long Jeremiah against neoliberalism and globalization and shallow American notions of, you know, market citizenship that were ruining the world. And it was like, you know, at the time I, I read this and it seemed a little overwrought and in, in a retrospect, it was absolutely prophetic. I mean, he simply sort of foretold the utter undoing of, of, of Davos man, you know, of Western liberalism in the coming years. Um, Shane, that's, that's wonderful. And thank you so much. And, and Ruth, before we, I certainly want you to have time to, to share those poems with us, but before we get to that, we've been, we've been talking about nature. You've been talking about Gordon's place in restoring and creating a different kind of language. We're talking about the experience of being Zionist and being Israeli and talking about the recovering him as a philosopher and seeing sort of very, the, the ways in which his thought is protean, it both encouraged people to work the land, but also provided resources for saying that there's limits to development. But I'd like to talk about, just curious to your thoughts on nationalism, the issue that rocks our world. What, what's you see as Gordon's legacy for ways that can help us think about nationalism because he very much gives it, he's a profoundly, he's one of these it's paradox with Gordon. He's like profoundly nationalist and profoundly ethical universalist at the very same time. So I'd love to hear what you on the other side. Well, it's easy for me because I'm a nationalist. I just okay. want to say to Shay before that two little stories. It's funny that things you heard in your life become history and people write on it. But I used to live for a while in the in Kibbutz Hulata, the kibbutz that was the, the fisherman that used to sail the Hula and make a living uh, from the fish there. And I met Azaria Alon's sister. She still lives there. She's an amazing woman. And she told me okay. how one day they got a message from the headquarters of the Labour Party that they have to dry the Hula. And they were shocked. This is our livelihood. We, we are fishermen. What do you mean to dry the hula? And they said to them that we need agriculture and that's the life of uh, the people. And if we want to have enough fields, there won't be food. And what is amazing is that they obeyed. There was a sense of trust to the authorities and they just kind of killed their own livelihood. And there still are old sheep there, but there is a nature reserve and you can see the bird, the migra migrating birds, but the size of it is only a little piece of what used to be the hula. The other story she told me is how the Society for the Protection of Nature was formed. And it's her brother, Azai Alon, who slept one night in a trip with, his, with her husband, his friend, and they were in a little tent that they built it for the night. And in the morning, Azai said, Look, there's this bird. You hardly see that any, uh, it anymore. They are almost the, the last ones of this species. And they talked between them and they said, something has to be done. And the next morning they formed the Society for the Protection of Nature. And you, you think to yourself how small everything was. The two friends in a hike made such a difference and changed our lives. Um, I want to say about nationalism, but again, excuse me, I want to say another thing. Another very big lesson from Gordon that I take is something about the intimacy and authenticity of meeting a human being. A lot of his writing, which I must say is very hard to read, and I'm grateful for one. I hope he, they did something with a, it's like a translation of a translation of a, I don't know what is the, 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 did he write? I don't know what is his first uh, language, John. Uh, uh, what, was, what was his mother's tongue? Yiddish. Gordon? Yiddish, Yiddish Gordon. and German or Russian? Or? Oh, no, his mother tongue was Yiddish, of course. Gordon? Yiddish and Loshim Akodesh in Hebrew. He, okay. he wrote Hebrew it was so nice. He, he was, uh, but, uh, he, he, nice he, for a prophet, it's himself. hard to read. He taught himself German and Russian and... and, and, uh, and well, therefore... well, when you think about it, it's almost almost the definition of being a prophet. Part of the job description of being a prophet is that in some way... Not ways, to be understood, except for by philosophers. 
Anyway, a lot of his writing, there's a very interesting book we, we used to read in Oranim, You're Not Alone in the Skies or in the Heavens, that oh, uh, is, Aleph Talet Golden is writing yeah. to Rachel, the poet. Yes, this is right here, right? In you know, Bud yes, Bud I'm amazed yeah. that you have it. It's rare. Yeah. And, and in these letters, it's something almost um, adolescent a kind of a drive and need to be completely honest, to be authentic, to be, to be yourself. Something like Ron said, to be creative, not work is only hammering, but work is as being yourself. It, it, it reminds me a little bit of Heschel, of living your life as a work of art. And so these letters that they used to write each other in the times of real letters of handwriting, that share everything I felt about you after you left and, and all kinds of things that maybe were better left out of the hands of historians like all of you. Um, that was another thing that affected Israeli culture in a very strong way of being honest, being, you know, sometimes when we meet American Jews and Israeli Jews, that's part of the problem <laughs> that we are kind of you come to a meeting, Israeli will immediately say, no, the problem in your, you know, something of that authenticity and being yourself and sharing the difficulty is not only Gordonian, but is also his. Now about being a nationalist, I was brought up by a Beitar father. So I don't see any, any conflict between feeling a part of the Jewish nation, being proud in being a part of the Jewish nation in Bialik terms, the, the Jewish spirit, the, the spirit of the nation, and wanting very much to do my share in this, uh, uh, like, you know, when you run and you give the stick from one to another. Yeah, Nationalism right. in the sense of Gordon and in the way I read him has nothing to do with putting down another nation. He talks about Palestinians. He gives a lot of respect in, the, in, in my view, maybe you read differently. Um, he's not blind to the fact that there are people living in this land oh, yeah. and the tragedy of Jews coming and having not really anywhere to go back to and Palestinians, Arabs that are here and not happy uh, for the country to become Jewish. And still, and yet at the same time, um, feeling the, the precious moment, feeling grateful. And I simply feel that to be living in this generation where we are able to walk back into concrete uh, life and work and roads and settlements and settlements as in kibbutzim and and Dganya is a concept that is so far out. It's the first. Dganya was the name of the kibbutz before kibbutzim had private names. Dganya Aleph and Dganya Bet. And this Hasidism, the, the name kibbutz is from kibbutz right. of uh, Hasidic followers. The the I think there were they were feeling that they have another chance to live, another chance to identify who they are. And mm -hmm. nationalism in that sense is coming back to normality. Like Shay said, coming back to the, to, to the body, but for the people to come back to a sense of, we are normal people and nationality, like all the others in his right. time. And like right. other but nations. Gordon, Gordon tends to see, Gordon very much sees nationalism not as a zero sum thing. You know, sort of in, completely. As, as, as I, I don't understand, think you know, the true nationalist understands that other people's nationalisms too. But Ron Mark Owen, do you have any thoughts on before we get back to the poems? Um, Gordon's ideas on nationalism and how they might be helpful today. It, it, it's a big discussion and controversy between scholars, of uh, meaning of, of Gordon's nationalism and. I Binyan, you know, Binyan Haumau, you know, Tikkun Binyan Haumau. Yes, uh, this is the book of uh, the late uh, Zeh Sternhill, who yes. said that Gordon is the... Right, where Gordon is the... Ben-Gurion, and, and I think that the, the 
the, these questions are big because um, it concern it, it relates to the question how do you understand, for example, Schelling and 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 his turn to nature and his turn to nation because uh, uh, we don't we it's it's for, uh, we don't remember that that Schelling was a humanist and, and a great humanist. And uh, we think we, we, we see the, the past through the, the, the later periods. And this is uh, one of the problems. Uh, concerning Gordon, the fact is when he, uh, he, he was in the end of his life, he came to Vienna and, uh, and he gave his big lecture, big uh, uh, sermon mm -hmm. lecture uh, about the um, human beings nationhood. Uh, he, he, for him, this was uh, he, he 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 tried to try to con convince his partners that uh, that uh, this must be the target of the uh, of the project. Uh, what does it mean, uh, uh, human beings, nationhood? Uh, according, he said, according to the Bible, the first human being, Adam, was created in the image of God. And we must create a new Jewish nation in the image of God in order that we shall not become in the future a state whose main objective is to have more and more power and control like the European states that destroyed each other for no reason in the first world war. And he said, he spoke this, uh, uh, these things uh, five years after or, or less than five years after the, the uh, end of the first world war. So uh, this is a fact that this was his mission and he didn't try to convince even his, his, his friends and partners to, to see this idea as the target of the Zionist uh, project. Um, so he, he was in the opposition uh, um, when he spoke about human beings nation. Uh, concerning his attitude to the Arab population, uh, I have a student who wrote in the last year, in, two years ago, he finished his uh, PhD dissertation about this question and, and he convinced me that even though uh, Gordon was uh, very liberal and, and, uh, and um, tried to be, to, to, to be very, uh, um, to understand the situation of the Arabs, he was, he was like uh, most of the uh, Zionist uh, leaders uh, from the point of view that um, he, he, he didn't see the problem, the whole problem with the, our, our population. He saw the, the, this problem uh, as, as, a, as a humanist. And, 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 and uh, from this point of view, he, he said that the two groups, every group will, will do its job. And the, 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 the end will be the, the result of, of these efforts. We have to do our effort, they will do what they want to do. And uh, then we should say he didn't, he, he was not politician. You know that Gordon didn't think about a state. He didn't want a state. Uh, many of the founders of, uh, of uh, Israel didn't think, he, he, he was not part of uh, the, the political uh, Zionism. Right. He, 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 he said in the same time that he spoke about this idea of a human beings nationhood, he said, we didn't wait to the Balfour Declaration. We came to change our life, to build new Jewish life in the land of Israel. And this is very symbolic because uh, he, he, his target was to build new Jewish communities, a new Jewish life. And, and uh, we must say that uh, even though concerning nature, as Shay said, uh, he, he saw the future, he didn't see the near future or he, he couldn't think about the problems mm -hmm. of nationhood and, 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 and uh, the full aspect of uh, the, Arab, the Arab's life in uh, Palestine. Uh, so I, I, I prefer to be in the middle concerning uh, this point. I think that Sternhill was too extreme. I think that Sternhill didn't see the, the, the fact that uh, his most 
close friends and students didn't accept his, many of his uh, ideas concerning this point. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the, the picture is more complicated. It's more complicated. Yes, I mean, if you're, if you're looking for the source of you know, Zionist militarism, I mean, Gordon is rather unlikely. He was against Jabotinsky. He was against... Right, against right of course. So he, he, yes. he, it would be a funny he, army. He, 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 it would be quite a funny army if Gordon was leading it. That's quite true. Um, he, should, before, we, before we ask Ruth, thank you so much. Um, before we finally hear the... the the poetry that Ruth Calderon has, has uh, provided for us. Shay, do you have any last thoughts on sort of this nexus of land and nation and nationalism? And does Gordon offer any resources for thinking about this constructively? Right, oh, everybody talk about how environmentalism is perhaps a basis for cooperation. On the other hand, it's rigor is for do environmental concerns just create new bases for competition? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I guess to me, I, I agree with what Ron said about how Gordon doesn't, I mean, it's, it's hard to, it's, sometimes it's hard to say, okay, what would Gordon say about this issue or that issue? Because they seem to be issues that he didn't foresee. But then on the other hand, you know, when, when you read what he, his descriptions of contact with the land of Israel as a Jewish person, as Jewish people coming into contact with the land of Israel and the way the pioneer generation of the second and third Aliyah built on those ideas and had this myopic focus, right, on uh, our relationship with the land that was really blind to the possibility of others having a, a similar type of relationship with la the land. That's my, that's my sense, uh, that, mm -hmm. that they, they, they were so focused on developing that relation for themselves with the land that they were, they were okay with others doing their thing, but they were blind to the Arabs as real competitors for the love of the land of Israel that not only did they pour in, but that was reflected back to them. They had a sense that, I don't know, Ani le dodi vedodi li, right? This kind of, applying these kinds of, of ideas to the land as this anthropomorphized creature. And I think that that was okay, maybe, that, 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 could, that could exist in kind of a peaceful way as long as it was doing its own thing. But if, if anything came between them and the land, you know, you're messing with a buzzsaw, it seems. I mean, and you see groups like Hashomer come along later on and, and, um, and, and right, you don't, you don't want to mess with them. Um, right. And so I think that when we look at environment in Israel today, it's fraught with those kinds of concerns because the conflict with the Palestinians is still going, right? The West Bank is still, is this the land of Israel or is this Palestinian territory? What's the status of this? And environmentalism becomes one of the weapons in that larger battle. And so I think there's still a national, even the people who've been influenced by Gordon in their view of nature and the environment, um, you know, Maron Benvenisti wrote in the 80s about how the settlement movement really kind of co-opted the idea or the labor Zionist relationship with the land and ideas of ahavata aretz, yediata aretz. Um, they take those things and use them to great effect in gaining control over the West Bank. So while Gordon may not have supported that movement or their ideas or their application of those ideas, they dovetailed pretty well with the ideas that Gordon and other pioneers of the second and third Aliyah had had articulated. Oh, so I guess, you know, it's, a, it's our third and final meeting. It's, I guess it's appropriately humbling and intellectually honest to say that G. Gordon doesn't have I one. would like to uh, but please Ruth. offer a different thought. I think when we see it, I mean, some, some, um, some acts could look the same, but they're very different in different historical moments. I think when the founding fathers of the United States meet the Native Americans, uh, that's one way of what, how they dealt with them. Then when the pilgrims, the Israeli Aliot came and saw the Arabs, the time of Gordon, they dressed like them. They acted like them. They drank coffee like them. They built tents like them. They were romanticizing them and they, they, they believed that they can live together. There was the the movement of the uh, Hebrews, they believe that we will, some of them believe that we, we are from the same origin and we might become one people. And others felt that we can share the country. They did not kill them. It didn't, what happened in America didn't happen in, in the Israel Valley. What happened later in the 70s 
uh, when the West Bank is being uh, uh, built by uh, the right in Israel and using the same vocabulary, it's a very different time when you already have a state, you have the power, and you know that these people are a minority and that's the place they have to live. It's not the same um, innocence that you can uh, grace, you can be generous with Gordon. It's not the same scenery. And, uh, and I don't know of another people that came to conquer a place and left its, its habitants and, and also worked with them, um, learned from them and fought with them. I mean, there was, there, it, is a, it is a war on, on the land. And the Jews that came had to have a place to, to be. The, the dilemma or the, the tragedy is, is given. But I don't think that we could talk about today's politics and go on. Somehow it feels that it's not precise. You know what I mean, Shai? It's, I know what you it, mean. It's hard, to, it's hard to just apply him directly to what's going on. It's right. like saying that Abraham wasn't a feminist because he had a few wives. Nahan, but, but it's not the same. Uh, OK, I'm sorry. So, now, so no, finally, if you could please, you've been very patient about this poetry. We'd like to yeah, see Yeah, maybe it's not exactly uh, appropriate. But Anna, can you please share the poem? I just felt that there's a way to give the feel of Gordon through a poem that Rachel, the poet, his very close friend wrote while they were together in Ghana. There's the famous story that she comes out with a geese and she's dressed in a white dress and he walks in and there's this moment when they meet each other and they become soulmates. And so I'll try to read the poem in uh, English, but we all think of it in Hebrew. He writes this when she's already uh, in the city and uh, can't live in Ghana anymore because she has a monocleosis. She's sick and they're afraid that she will, uh, it's like today, she's, they should, they're afraid that she will affect someone else. And it's a sad story, but it gives the image of a Gordonian moment in my view. Mm -hmm. The lie, perhaps. And perhaps none of these things ever happened. And perhaps never have I woken up with dawn to go to the garden to plow in the sweat of my face. Never during those long and hot days of harvest atop a wagon loaded with sheaves, I don't know how to spell this to pronounce, have I broken into song. Never have I cleansed myself in the quiet blueness and innocence of my Kineret. Oh, my Kineret, were you there or was it all a dream? I think it's a song that every Israeli knows by heart. And it's a moment for me, I, for me, it's my favorite prayer and favorite song. And it's a moment of being alone going down to the garden, working as again, as the one said, as a, as a ceremony, religious ceremony almost. And then this small lake that in America wouldn't even be given a name for them mm -hmm. is such an important place that every Israeli knows if it went up a centimeter or down a centimeter, it's in the news every day and in the newspaper. And, and they came from places full of lakes, but, but but washing yourself in the Kinneret was again, like Jesus in, uh, in the Jordan, a place of, of worship, a place of being mm -hmm. reborn. And yeah. so I, I, I'm a rom romantic, I guess, and, uh, and I'm not Thank this you. hardcore uh, criticism, but I think this is a, a, a Gordonian moment. Yeah, uh, Ron Marco, you wanted to say something. I want to say some something when, uh, after I heard uh, my dear friend uh, I, because I, I, I don't think that the situation is so so simple concerning the past. I'm from a very Zionist family, my both grandparents 
uh, were part of the third Aliyah and the uh, very Zionists. And, and um, I think that from the beginning, the, we had here in, in Palestine before the establishment of the state of Israel, two models of how to live with the Arabs. I live in Tel Aviv, but I am from Haifa. One model is Tel Aviv. Second model was Haifa and also Jerusalem at the beginning. In Tel Aviv, the Jews left Jaffa and built a separate Hebrew, the first Hebrew city, a Jewish city. In Haifa, which was the vision of Herzl, the real vision of Herzl, he spoke about it, he didn't think about Tel Aviv. He spoke and about an Arab Haifa. mayor, right? Yes, in Haifa, it was a mutual uh, city. Build the, the independence law. And, 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 and the decision of Gordon to, to support the separate settlements is closer to the model of Tel Aviv than the model of Haifa. That's very interesting. And I agree to, with you. I'm happy to be humbled a little bit. <laughs> and, I and don't think he was a. Secondly, secondly what my dear, the idea of the whole Eretz Israel was not the idea of the religious right, but the idea of the founders of Achdut Avuda and the, the, the late Rabenkin from El Harod and the, uh, the later Chelyanet Ben Tzvi and Alterman and even Chaim Horui. And the only one, two, two, three rabbis were in this, uh, uh, among the founders. The, it was not their idea. It even was not the idea of the right because the right also, they, they, uh, they, uh, um, they came to this group. So. Yes, but not, the, 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 the same idea it's, might be right and wrong in different of times. Course. Of course, but but um, we can't separate the the. I, I agree. I'm not a historian. I, I apologize. <laughs> so so I, I I think that the model, uh, it was Zionist, the same Zionist model, and and uh, even the same people, Dizengoff, was part of the Zion, the general Zionism, the the the, the party of uh, of Herzl and the founders. Mm -hmm. Haifa, the, the Jewish founders of Haifa was not, were not the labels. They were also from the, the uh, brother of Weizmann and others. So these two models were, were two experiences. They, they, they tried to, to, to they tried this and they tried that. And the, the fact is that um, in, in, even today, there is a tension between these two models. And uh, this is the story. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before I hand this over to Alex Kay, I just want to mention one, a brand new book about of Gordon, Gordon Ania that came out a couple weeks ago, um, a collection called Imne Dala Vakesh Chayim, If We Will Know to Seek Life, edited by Nama Shakay. Ah, okay, there you have it, right? And actually a link to this new volume um, I'm putting out in the chat, a collection of articles and essays by contemporary Israelis and their encounters with Gordon. Um, and indeed, just last week, I was in a workshop with Namasha Kade, where one of the things we did was reading through bits of Gordon's correspondence with these young pioneers, interpreting, writing, reflecting on it. So there's all sorts of aspects of Gordon that we haven't touched on yet. But as I bow out now, I just want to thank everyone again for this remarkable group of conversation and, and especially these last few exchanges which you had, which sort of in the best way, open up more questions than the answer. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Yuda. So after the, that fantastic and uh, deep conversation, um, we've had a whole host of questions from the audience and I'm gonna do my best to kind of um, clump them together in, in ways that are answerable in the 20 minutes that we have left. So um, first of all, a question about the historiography of Gordon. So, um, Ruth, you you opened up with this um, uh, with this observation that that Gordon had given you the permission to be sort of secular and religious at the same time, or secular and speak about God at the same time. Um, 
but historically, um, you know, that permission was taken by you, um, but it wasn't taken by people as much in the 1970s or 1960s or 1950s, the 1940s in the mainstream of, of labor Zionism. So, so Gordon was certainly used by um, the kind of Mapai Zionism, but he was edited. Um, and we also heard from, from Ron about how the, 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 literally the manuscript was edited to, to talk about some things and, and, and not other things. So I'd be very interested to hear from any of you, from all of you, anybody who wants to, to come in on this about how Gordon has been used differently in different periods of time. And what is it about the past 10, 15 years that have allowed aspects of Gordon that previously were, were, were kind of um, brushed under the carpet to, to re-emerge? Um, Ruth, seeing as you, 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 you open with that observation, maybe we'll start with you. And then if Ron and Shay want to jump in afterwards, I'd be delighted to hear, hear from all of you. I actually would, wanted to hear from Shay and Ron, but I'll just say that um, I was brought up traditional. And so when I came into the labor education in Oranim, I was an outsider in a, in a way. And so I felt that although Gordon is on the table, read as the worker and the authentic relationship and all of that, there is between the lines an option of religiosity that is not organized. What I loved about him, what I love about him is that he talks about free religion, about um, private kind of something that is not institutionalized with no church. And, um, but I have no historical uh, talent in me. So I would like the historians around me to, to answer. Well, I can say one thing uh, as, as someone who uh, kind of is coming again, uh, not being an Israeli dealing, growing up with Gordon, right? Uh, I can say for me, I started taking Gordon seriously when I ran across the work of Boaz Neumann, the Israeli historian who he wrote a book in Hebrew called Chukata Halutzim, which was focusing on the desire of the pioneers, the lust for the pioneers of the pioneers for the land of Israel. And he doesn't talk so much about Gordon, but he talks about the literature surrounding him. And what separated his discussion of Gordon from say Sternhell's discussion of Gordon was that Neumann focused on the ecstatic dimensions of Gordon's writing and thinking, right? The, um, the, the, the cosmology that, go, that is inherent under, underneath Gordon's work, right? So not just applying him to these prosaic concerns case by case, but seeing him as a thinker who had a whole cosmology. And I know Neumann wasn't the, the first to see it that way, I think, but um, that helped me to take him seriously as a thinker. And I, I don't know how that has affected the revival in, Gore, in Gordon since... 2011, 2012, I think is when Neumann wrote his work. But I think that was toward the beginning of this new efflorescence of, uh, of literature on Gordon. So maybe Ron can spoke, speak a little bit more to, to that. Look, when my late friend Boaz decided to write about uh, Gordon as the, the, the appendix to, to his book, he came to discuss this, this issue with me. He also wrote in the uh, some, some sentences about it in the Hebrew edition, I don't know. Um, when we spoke about this, he spoke about his grandparents who were part of the Third Aliyah. And I told him, you know, Boaz, this is the same story. And we spoke about our families. And uh, I showed him, I brought him some, some pieces and books. And, and I, I showed him, the, we spoke about this connection between Gordon and the urge for the land, as he called it, uh, when he wrote about the, the, the people of the Second Aliyah. Um, and I think that uh, they didn't take, they couldn't take seriously the philosophy of Gordon, but they took seriously his personality and, and his, his uh, approach to, to to the to the labor to the work to the to the land to uh, and and um, I think that uh, in the last decades 
more people, young people in Israel uh, can, can hear, can, they can hear the religiosity that Ruth spoke so, so much about it. And I, I think that you are right, that this is the point, the uh, um, uh, secular religiosity of Gordon. As I wrote about the secular religiosity of Jonas, but I thought when I wrote about, <laughs> about Gordon, uh, and and uh, I think that uh, one of the reasons is the change in concerning Marxism, uh, the atmosphere in the beginning of the second, in the in the twenties in Israel among the laborers and the, among the the pioneers, they were socialist and very close to Marxism, more or less, they, they argue about it, and, but the atmosphere was very atheist. And, and uh, Gordon was very encouraged to speak with them in, 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 in this way. Um, I, 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 I must say that um, I heard about Gordon uh, when I was young by a famous educator in Israel, Joseph Schechter, who established uh, also a college to-, to in, Haifa. Call, in Haifa, and he called this college. And this college was a union between two, three colleges uh, in, in, before the, the, the establishment of the state. And after Ben Gurion decided to unite the, what they call the trends in education, uh, they give him the opportunity to, to take the College of the Labor Party and the College of the Harry Ali School, which was the, the main school of the Zionist, uh, the, the uh, general Zionism and the Bourgain bourgeois Zionism. And, and uh, he called this college on the name, they have the name of, of, of Gordon because he very appreciated the, uh, uh, Gordon and, and um, because of his secular religiosity. And in those days, Schechter, that some of his students uh, founded the settlement in the 60s, Yud Fat, it was very rare. But today, uh, these, these writings and this understanding that Gordon has something to say to, say to, to us um, became, became something that uh, many young people look for and, 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 and can find it in, in, in his writings. So can let, I me, let me ask. Hold, I, actually, just... I, 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 I'm, I, your, everybody wants to hear from all of you, but also I feel Sorry. some obligation to get I to some of the thought. things that were asked, and we only have 10 minutes left, and I'm, I'm, I apologize for doing that. Um, I, I, I just want to bring up one last question that, that arose here regarding this kind of d distinction between religion and religiosity, and then a couple of questions about nature in particular. Um, there, there's a question that I have to ask, because in the chat, um, this question was asked, by Mel Skult, um, and of course in Zoom, you can give whatever name you want to yourself, but I'm assuming that's the Mel Skult who um, very famously wrote a lot of celebrated work about Mordechai Kaplan. And he was asking if, if um, I guess Ron could elaborate a bit on Gordon's use of Hasechel and Elam as a way of talking about God. And I'll just put this in some context. You know, um, Kaplan of course was a bit later than Gordon, but Kaplan building on people like uh, Santayana, William James, and others, this was a period where Gordon is not the only one trying to talk about God without talking about God. And uh, I, I, do you have anything to say, Ron, about fitting this aspect of his religion without religion into more global philosophical trends? I think that uh, the, the hidden intellect, the Sechel Nelam, is very close to the concept uh, that Sholem wrote about it, but uh, he, I don't think that uh, uh, he's writing about the Kadmuta Sechel, the, the intellect before the intellect. Uh, and, and there is connection between these two concepts because uh, for Gordon, it was very important to speak about uh, uh, cognition, hakara, and chavaya, which we can say experience, but chavaya is a very unique word that he invented in Hebrew. We had no Chavaya before Gordon. And the, no. I, the idea, when he invented this word, he, he spoke about combination between life, Chaim, and Havaya, being. Chavaya, it's a combination of Chaim and Havaya, life and being. The ability to feel the life, 
which is something before before the intellect or, or, or uh, and 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 something that uh, you can find in 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 some kabbalistic in not some many kabbalistic sources and, and maybe this is the main discussion between the philosophers and the kabbalists in the medieval time uh, when the the philosophers identified god with intellect and the kabbalists with something which before the intellect maybe the will something which we can understand from 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 the philosophy of schopenhauer concerning the 19th century and and i think that this was the point that he was close he he he, he tried to speak all the time about the the contrast of cognition as 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 the experiences in the meaning of havaya and and uh when you think that the meaning of God is the is the um, this aspect, so you try to overcome the most of the discussions in the 19th century or after Kant, when you, when the, those philosophers who spoke about God in the uh, old way or in the traditional uh, European way. Of speaking about the connection between God and, and and intellect, and now after Kant, we can't speak about God as intellect because we have no direct uh, uh, approach to, to 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 this transcendental intellect. Gordon tried to overcome this this uh, crisis because he read Kant and he also uh, taught Kant to 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 the young people in in in. In, in the breaks of the work <laughs> when they worked in the in the fields uh, and this was his way to overcome this this crisis so i think that uh, this is the reason that we can find also connection between hasidism and and and, and some ideas of early kabbalah or, or in kabbalah or the 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 big beginning of the the the, 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 the origin of the theosophy and, and Gordon. So um, it is a serious uh, issue. And this is the reason that I see him as maybe the, the most important philosopher of, the, uh, of Judaism in the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, it was not an uh, accident that uh, Martin Buber saw him as uh, his grand teacher, even though he met him once. And, and, and after this, he, he wrote about it, uh, very, very interesting things. So there is parallelism between the, the idea of separation, separating uh, religion and religiosity in Buber's and in, in, and in Gordon. And we know that there is also historical explanation. Gordon read Zimmel, Georg Zimmel, the, to, the teacher of Buber. He read it in German. His, his uh, daughter spoke that in Russia, he spoke with them about Zimmel in Russia. Uh, he spoke about Zimmel, and um, and uh, the, the book that uh, Ruth spoke about it, actually, uh, that uh, uh, Mukitsur uh, wrote. He, he, brought, he brought it in his introduction, the, this quotation from uh, Yael Gordon's uh, memories about Gordon and Zimmel. So it's not an accident. Thank you, Ron. So um, we, we come now to, I think, what will be the last question, and and, and bringing a few different points in the chat together here. And these questions are all on the theme of some kind of skepticism about um, the idea of nature itself. Shay, you spoke about how um, it, there's, there's no such thing as an unencountered nature. Um, and even if there is, once you've encountered it, it's then, then gone. So a couple of points of skepticism that arose in the chat, which I'd love to hear you reflect on Shay and then, and then Ruth as well, if, you have, if, you, if you'd like to add anything. Um, two kind of angles of skepticism. The first one is, um, you know, is, is this idea of nature, has it been hijacked um, in, in the, um, it, for some kind of um, nationalistic or sometimes capitalistic um, goal? You know, there was a story, um, it must be nearly 20 years ago now about American families coming over and paying money to have trees planted and that some, enormous percentage of them would just die and then be replaced by other trees. And, and I just found the article in the New York Times where somebody was saying, you know, even if they die, it's not important. What's really important is the experience. So um, is that what's really important? Like the human experience, you pay money to get the experience of nature, even if 
um, that nature is, there's something kind of very unnatural about that nature. That's, that's the one angle of skepticism. And the other angle of skepticism is a question about elitism. Um, it can be very difficult and expensive to have a simple encounter with nature. Um, you need a day off work, you need a car, um, you need access to land. Um, um, Shana Weiss, Dr. Weiss brought up in the chat, um, Nachalasi, which is, you know, a, a land, a, a body of water that was public access for many, many years, but then a kind of predominantly Ashkenazi kibbutz kind of closed it off because they didn't want it to be ruined by, um, you know, predominantly Mizrahi. Um, Did you speak about it in America also? <laughs> I can't believe it. Well, Dr. Weiss knows about a lot of things that are only spoken about in Israel too. I'm not sure how widely known that fact is, but now you know we're bringing it into the conversation. So those are those are the kind of the angles of skepticism that arose in the conversation, and we only have a few minutes, so we can't really do it justice. But Shay, I wonder if you'd like to have a go at that. Sure, I'll mention very quickly. I think um, so. <laughs> Well, first, you know, regarding questions of access and who has access and whether encounters with nature are kind of an elite thing. Uh, look, I mean, we think of the environment as somehow benign. We think of it as the water in which we all swim and that therefore maybe it's not political or maybe it's not subject to these capitalist forces or, or, or economic forces, but when really they are, right? I mean, we're always framing nature all the time. In the United States, in the, in the wake of like, you know, Black Lives Matter protest movements, things like that, there are big questions right now about who has access to nature, really. We have natu national parks in which supposedly everyone can, can go and they belong to everyone. But really, uh, when we see nature portrayed in the media, um, there's, a, there's a book called Black Faces, White Spaces, for example, that talks about African-American engagement with national parks and nature reserves in the United States and the difficulties in ensuring fair access for everyone. In Israel, the, those who have claimed the mantle of Gordon have always, I think, uh, struggled to reconcile full access for everyone and imposing limits and boundaries to keep nature from being destroyed by people. So uh, when we go back to the last disciple of Gordon, Yishar Smilansky, S. Yishar, when he was a member of the Knesset in 1962, he gives a famous speech in which he, um, he co-opted, <laughs> up until that point, uh, the Department of Landscape Improvement, if you can imagine that title, which uh, worked in the prime minister's office as if the landscape is something that needs to be improved, right? Um, it tells you something about the way nature was viewed. Uh, they wanted to establish national parks, which were very limited, right? Kind of a, a food stand, a swimming pool, and a little fenced-in area. And uh, Smilansky gets up before the Knesset and gives a, a great speech that Ben-Gurion himself later quotes long sections of uh, when the National Parks and Nature Re Reserves law in its fullest is, is finally drafted. And Ben-Gurion ends up turning against his own Department of Landscape Improvement and takes Smilansky's side and says that big areas of the country, 25% of the country at the time, needs to be set aside as nature reserves. But the big pushback on that was from the purists, who also claimed to be disciples of Gordon, and said, how can you prevent us from encountering the land? How can you prevent, how can you put up a fence, or how can you charge admission, or how can you say we can only walk on a marked trail? Uh, so that tension of protecting nature and limiting human access without doing it in a way that privileges certain groups, I think is one that Israel struggles with and that environmentalists around the world are still working to figure out. Shay, thank you. So Ruth, um, in the one minute left, would you like to have the last word before I, I first, close? The first thing I want to say is that this is the most sophisticated chat I've ever seen in a conversation. <laughs> you can study each, uh, each piece of it. I just wanted to add, and uh, Yuda uh, did, 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 gave me the honor of writing it, that I think because of the Jewish Renaissance in Israel that started in the 80s, and I had the good uh, fortune to be there founding Elul in 89, I think that is the reason that Godun is coming back and there is a, an audience that is ready to hear of free religiosity, uh, the Mechinot, and so on. So. That is one thing. And I just want to say thank you to all of you. I learned so much this evening. Ruth, Ron, Shay, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Um, and I would just like to say to everybody listening that this session and the other two sessions we've had in this series on Gordon will all be available on the website of the Schusterman Center along with all of our other 
events. It's pretty cool. We now have this kind of database of four and a half hours of 12 scholars talking about Gordon and, um, and there's much but else there. Gordon is happy inside. up there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> um, and um, please see our events page for, for events that are coming up. Um, I'll just mention one, which is that this, um, this coming Thursday, um, we're having Professor Yoram Bilu of uh, Hebrew University um, mm -hmm. talking us about um, the, um, well, the title of the talk is Making the Absent Rebbe Present in Messianic Chabad. Um, so we'll see you there and for other events. Again, thank you to our panelists and to everyone that joined.